All right, welcome to part three of Staying Alive. So the first two times I spent a lot of time talking about my personal story, how I got to the point where I made a switch to a new lifestyle. And uh, last time we ended by talking a little bit about the issue of animal products as a dietary subject. And so today I'm gonna to talk more about that. And as you already have heard, my new regimen is vegetarian. No meat at all. Now, let me speak about those terms, vegetarian and so forth. There are three general terms that get talked about. One is vegetarian, one is vegan, one is plant-based whole foods, which is a mouthful. Now, I like the word vegetarian because it's pretty straightforward and simple. But unfortunately, that word has been mangled by usage because vegetarians often eat fish or eggs or dairy products. So there's a sort of an asterisk by the word vegetarian where they're not really totally plant-based. So that word has become almost meaningless. So then came the word vegan, which is intended to distinguish from vegetarian in that there are no animal products in the vegan diet. No fish, no dairy, no eggs, nothing related to animal products. Well, that would fit me, except that it's not specific enough because there are other things that are vegan that I won't eat, like oil and chemicals and sugar and refined flour. These are all plant foods. Well, chemicals are not. They're, they're non-animal products, but that doesn't mean they're healthy. And it so happens that vegan is often associated with a particular ideology, which is okay if you want that kind of thing, or not, depending on the person. So to deal with that ambiguity comes the latest mouthful, which is plant-based whole foods. Chemicals are not foods. Refined flour is not a whole food. It's a partial extract of a food. Plant-based meaning no animal products, only plants. So that word or that phrase is the most descriptive. And it's also, as I said, a mouthful. And it sounds goofy. Because I don't really think it's plant-based. I think it's just plants. I don't know what the difference between plant-based and plants are. You know, it's like um, saying water is H2O based. Well, no, it's, it's the same thing. It's just redundant. Anyway, so I may use any of those words to mean the same thing, which is basically no animal products and no processed food. And uh, I, I kind of tend to personally like the word vegetarian <laughs> for that. <clears throat> so anyway, whatever I say, that's what I mean. So, as a vegetarian, or as a vegan, or as the case may be, no animal products. Now, let me just say, first of all, I'm not advocating that a person be completely free of animal products. In fact, I don't think that's 100% natural. It's about the proportion. And the proportion of animal products ought to be, ideally, low. Lower than what we typically find in our culture. So let me go back to the beginning, when God created the world. Oh, and by the way, speaking of God creating the world, as I research these matters and review expert opinions and so forth, a lot of the content I see is evolution-based, saying, oh, because of the history of how humankind developed, this is the impact on diet. And I, I think that's irrational. There's nothing about evolution or evolutionary theory that really says anything more than the design we see that we call evolution. If you take the word evolution, I just put God in there. It makes more sense. God designed this. This is a functional design. There's a reason for it. God designed that way. And I think the opposite is true that when we look to creation, we see, we see insight rather than to evolution. So that's, that's my framework that I come from. So speaking of creation, I'm interested to know, how did God create us? What condition did he create us in? What, what's the ideal diet for the human being? So I'm gonna take you back to Genesis chapter one, verse 29, God's creating the world. And it says, and God said, see, I have given you, speaking of man, <clears throat> every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be food. 
So the first thing we hear in the creation story about the food for humankind is that it's plant-based. It's, it's, it's vegetarian food. There really is no indication that animal products are part of a human diet. And this was the case for a long time until after the flood of Noah's day, when Noah came out of the ark after the flood, God said to him, this is, I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, it says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even as the green herbs. So God is saying, used to be green herbs were the basic framework. Now I'm expanding your menu. <clears throat> Animal foods, too. Okay, why there? Why at that point in time? Well, I don't know, but I have a theory. I have a speculation. And it has to do with the impact of the flood on the earth. And uh, before the flood, the human gene pool was very rich with diversity. Before the flood, the vegetable gene pool was very rich with diversity. Most of those things went extinct. Well, all of humankind, except for eight individuals, went extinct. So the whole human gene pool lost a lot of its diversity. That's why we see the longer lifespans before the flood and the shorter lifespans after the flood, diminishing over time. Also, the earth changed. The vegetable plant, I mean, the uh, gene pool of the plants, also a lot of that stuff went extinct. So we've got humankind living on a fraction of its original genetic diversity and eating food a fraction of its general of its uh, genetic diversity so god said well we need to supplement a little bit that's what i think now the question though is do you take the supplement and turn it into a staple make it three meals a day that's the issue that's where it becomes a problem and in ancient times or up until modern times, not even ancient times even a hundred years ago it was not common for people to eat the diet that we eat today in terms of the proportion of meat in our diet. It wasn't easy to come by that quickly or easily or profusely. But now in modern times, because of all of our advances and so forth, it's everywhere. And we've kind of grown up believing and experiencing that it's normal to have meat all the time everywhere. When in reality, if you had meat as a, as a proportion of your diet, let's say, five to 10% of your diet. That would probably be the optimal normal. But as it is now, it's more like 40, 30, 40%, maybe more. And that's too much for the human body. Now, let me give you another story from the Bible. As you may remember in Daniel chapter one, Israelites have been captured by the Babylonians. Daniel's there in the king's court, having been selected as a special person and him and his buddies. And the king wanted to feed them all his delicacies to fatten them up and so forth. And he said, well, this is not really what God has prescribed for me. I'd rather just go vegetable, see how we turn out. So he uh, was granted the opportunity to go vegetarian for 10 days and him and his buddies. And after 10 days, they were healthier and fatter than their comrades who ate all the king's delicacies. So imagine that. A vegetarian diet actually is good for you. So those are just some tidbits about some history. Now, let me just say, first of all, if you decide to go completely vegetarian or vegan or whatever, no animal products at all, you will lack one nutrient, which is vitamin B12. So you need to supplement. And the reason for that is because B12 is a vitamin that exists, it, it's created by bacteria in the soil. So when animals graze, they just lick it up out of the soil. It's just part of the dirty uh, food that they eat. If you yank a potato out of the ground and just rinse it and eat it, you're going to get B12 from the soil because you didn't scrub that thing and clean it all off the surface of it. So I think in ancient times, before the modern habit of really cleaning food thoroughly, people were getting their B12 even if they didn't have animal products to have it. So uh, now in the modern day, everything is so clean that you won't get it from dirt on your vegetables and you're going to get it from animal food or you're going to supplement and it's an easy thing to do just pop one little pink pill every day and it'll probably take you five years to go deficient if you didn't you don't need that much of it but anyway there you go 
Okay, so let's talk about the difference between carnivores like a cat and a human being. A cat has a short digestive tract because meat digests rather quickly. It's more energy dense and there's no fiber at all in meat. And if you're a carnivore, that works for you. And so you have a short digestive tract, gets rid of it quickly, and that's how it is. But we are, we have a long digestive tract because it's designed to accommodate the longer process of digesting complex carbohydrates. And so animal products are not supposed to make it to the colon, but if you eat a lot of them, they will, some of them will survive and get there. And then in the colon, they wreak havoc. <laughs> they putrefy with bacteria that feed on them. Not the bacteria you like. There are bacteria in your gut that you do like that help you digest fiber and so forth. But the bacteria that will putrefy meat produces toxic chemicals like ammonia, for example. And these chemicals lead to diseases of the colon, colon cancer and so forth. Now, this is in contrast to carbohydrate fermentation by friendly bacteria that actually produces beneficial byproducts. And your, the, the bacteria in your intestines help digest your food and produce certain nutrients that you can't get without those bacteria doing what they do. And so you gotta feed them with plant-based fiber. Now, there's, there's protein in animal products, there's protein in plants. One of our myths on our myth sheet is you need more protein. Protein is everywhere. But plant-based protein is different than animal-based protein. And the difference is that animal-based proteins have more sulfur-containing amino acids, which turn into hydrogen sulfate, hydrogen sulfide, which is that rotten egg smell you've, you've smelled before. So what's going on in the colon? Again, colon diseases. This interferes with the function of good bacteria. But if you feed the colon, the feed the colon's good bacteria with fiber, produces healthy nutrients and anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. All right, so a couple of more tidbits before we get into more, more specifics. Animal proteins increase certain hormones in the body, such as IGF-1, which is called insulin-like gro insulin growth factor, which feeds cancer. Another one, uh, an amino acid, methionine, is essential for cancer. These are animal-based proteins and amino acids. Now, your diet is a zero-sum game, which means that if you eat certain things, you only have a certain amount, you've used up a certain amount of room in your stomach, and you're gonna eat less of other things. If you eat less of some things, that leaves you more room for other things. And so, if you were to cut back on animal products, then you have the room to increase your vegetable and fruit and fiber intake, and you get the double benefit of reducing the bad and increasing the good. On the flip side, if you have a lot of animal products, you not only have added the bad, but you've reduced the amount of good that you're bringing in. So, each side affects the other. It's a double whammy. Now, I'm gonna talk about certain particular processes that are known to occur on a particular diet, but there are many processes we don't know. All we see are the results. And so science tries to figure out what's going on in the mechanism of how things happen, but it also makes observations and just says, well, if this is consistently observed, it must be true. And a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about in terms of the benefits of a plant-based diet is that the benefits are there. Whether we understand how they came to be or not, they are there. And the detriments of too much animal protein and too much animal fat, even though we don't know why they produce some of the diseases they do, they do. It's been observed uh, consistently enough that it's conclusive that it does have this effect. That's why there's such a long list of diseases that are affected by diet. And some of them we understand the mechanism for how they work and some they don't. And but if you experiment with a new diet, you may find a cure that is inexplicable, but works. And so that's the benefit of it. You don't have to understand how it works. You only have to believe and be convinced and try to see if it does work. And if it does, bingo, you're good. And it does work. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, 
Well, first of all, I have done a lot of research, and as I do that, I'm looking for experts that really know something. I listen to somebody, I read their stuff, and I go, ah. and then other times I go, oh, that's good. That's that makes sense. And I check into it more, and I become, I, I, be, I, I tend to like that particular expert. And then I start liking another expert, and then certain of these experts' names keep popping up over and over and over. And now I've got myself a hall of fame of what I consider to be very reliable experts. So I'm gonna feature a few of them here, telling you from the horse's mouth their own scientific research. About six minutes of video for each of three experts. I want you to hear it direct from them. These are some of my favorites. I made a list of them, which I'll put on the screen here. And you can have a piece of paper there. Dr. T. Colin Campbell talks about cancer. Dr. Neil Barnard talks about diabetes. And Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn talks about cardiovascular disease. So let me just mention too that Campbell did two things. This is his book, by the way. It's called The China Study. He did research in the conventional sense, animal studies and so forth, which he's gonna talk about on the video. But what he doesn't talk about is this, his second part of his work, which is he studied people in China and their diet. And the reason why it was in China is because the government in China does whatever they want. So when they want to do something, it gets done. So he cooperated with the Chinese government because he and they wanted to study diet in a large population of many hundreds of millions of people across a diversity of ethnicities and regions. And uh, so the Chinese government could facilitate the largest scientific study ever of anything in terms of people and size and scope and time. It's just huge. And they've got a, he's got a, an avalanche of data from that study about diet and how it affects your life. So the video is going to talk about his um, animal studies. Let me back up. And the, I'll tell you a little bit more about the book after that. So let me turn up the volume a little bit here. See if that works. Without getting into the details of why I got involved in this particular line of research, um, I just want to show you some results. These are results having to do with experimental animals. And uh, I learned early on, actually when I was working in the Philippines, uh, sort of survey or, 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 or coordinating a nationwide program of feeding malnourished children, uh, that uh, protein, it seemed, uh, played a role in cancer development. And it was on that basis, without getting, as they say, into all the details, it was on that basis that I came home and we organized a a rather major research project that continued for the next about 30 years, uh, funded mostly by the National Institutes of Health and also by the American Cancer Society, that led to this, this series of results that I'm going to describe here. And I just want to just touch on just a couple of highlights. I can show hundreds of slides to illustrate this point, but I think these, these next two or three slides might do the trick. Basically, the cancer that we were looking at in this particular case as a model to understand cancer was liver cancer in rats to be specific and so we were interested in the, the effect of protein on the development of this cancer over the development of that cancer this slide here basically shows that over the early stages of that development first 12 weeks if we fed diets that contained the good levels of protein the recommended levels of protein which incidentally is 20 percent of total calories as opposed to feed and diets 5%, which is considered not to be enough. Quite frankly, it is enough when you get to the adults. But in any case, feeding the regular levels, the good levels, as you can see, the, the cancers, once formed, started to grow over that first 12 weeks, and quite a dramatic difference. This coincided, in fact, with an observation that was made by some Indian workers prior to that that really got me into this. But then, the next uh, series of studies, illustrated here in one slide, really turned out to be quite provocative. Namely, 
If we started feeding animals in the first three weeks, for example, 20% protein, the good levels, the recommended levels, if you will, and then switch them to 5%, we turn the cancer off. If we then returned and fed them the 20% protein diet, it turns it on. So we got to a point in time when we could actually turn on and turn off cancer development. Admittedly, it was the early stages. So it begs some questions of whether or not this really applied to, let's say, full-blown tumors. But in any case, this is the early stages, first 12 weeks. And it was the period during promotion. Now, the promotion period, as I say, that's the period, of, I'll return to that, that's the period during which the, the, the nutrition, acting as a fertilizer, if you will, of growing these cancer seeds, that's the period of time that's really critical in this whole process. But it turned out we were feeding 20% and 5%. But I wanted to know something about, what about the intermediate levels? Going, let's say, from 4% up to 20%. Protein is an essential nutrient, and I'm sure that you all appreciate that. We need protein. The question I'm really referring to here is what happens when we consume protein in excess of our needs? And so this is illustrated here in these experimental animal studies, namely up to 10% protein. That's about the amount they need. They don't actually even need that, but they need about that at least, uh, for, or, or that, that's plenty for them to uh, do all the good things the protein does. And it's when they start consuming diets in excess of 10%, we can see the mister starting to, to develop. And that concept of, of, of threshold is, is common to nutrient action. There's also times nutrient thresholds. The nutrients are good things. They do good things for us. But when we exceed the threshold, we see the level that, you know, beyond that, that's where we get into mystery. And that threshold concept, is, as I say, is, is, uh, is very important in the context of what I'm going to tell you here. Now, what I just quickly described was what happens in the early stages of cancer development. Here's a study where we followed cancer development during the entire lifetime of these animals. A lifetime in case of a rat is about two years, about 100 weeks. And so what we did there, we just fed 5%, 20%. We actually did more than that. This is just as a, a, a sample of some of the data out of a very large study. But we fed 5% or 20% diets for the entire 100 weeks. And if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see the degree of cancer formation. We call it tumor severity, which takes into consideration the numbers of tumors as well as the growth rate, the size of the tumors. And you can see a huge difference, a huge difference. Feeding the good levels of protein really turned on that cancer, big time. And this coincided, in fact, what the early workers in India had done, coincided with what I thought I saw in the children in the Philippines as well. 5%, no. The really interesting part of their study, if you can see there in the, sort of the second column area on the left, is that the 20% animals all died, were all dead at the end of their lifetime of liver cancer. These animals had been exposed to a carcinogen that caused liver cancer, but they're all dead. The animals get to 5%, allegedly not enough to support good health. They're all alive and thrifty. Their hair coats were asleep, they were hopping in a cage, they were energetic, all the rest and no cancer. It was dramatic, it was dramatic. And we actually looked at this in many different ways. The protein we were using was casein. Casein is the main protein of cow's milk. Soy protein, wheat protein didn't do that, even when it was fed at 20% of calories. So there's a dramatic difference between casein and these plant-based proteins. I found this to be provocative, and that's an understatement, because I'm raised, I was raised on a dairy farm. Milk and cows, and we milked cows, and we drank milk, and I drank generous quantities of milk, because in those days, to the extent that I even knew anything about nutrition, it was largely because of the protein content in the cow's milk that we thought we were doing the right thing. I actually went away to... Did you catch that last part? That the... Plant proteins don't do what the animal proteins do at higher levels. So the point being, he found a, dis a, a direct link between high levels of animal protein and cancer. Could turn cancer on or off just by controlling the animal protein content. Can you believe that? So in the China study, <clears throat> after studying millions of people across the whole country, he found that when you consider all the factors that diet was the greatest factor in health. In other words, they would find people that were living in one town or village over here, and then next door town or village, different results, completely different results. And then it didn't really matter how far away these people were from each other, 
the results were just scattered all over the place. And the reason is because in a, in a community, people tend to have the same kind of culture and lifestyle. And then in, next door, they might have a different one. And the difference was their diet. So it wasn't geographically based, it was diet based that happened to be geographically organized. It wasn't based on gender, it wasn't based on ethnicity, it wasn't based on age. When you account for all the variables, the level of cancer and other diseases directly correlated to diet and directly correlated to the volume of animal protein that people were consuming. The more the animal protein, the more the disease. In fact, the easiest way to track that was check the cholesterol. The higher the cholesterol, the more the disease. Not because cholesterol necessarily causes cancer or causes other disease, even though it might, but just because cholesterol is higher when you have an animal uh, diet and therefore it becomes a correlating factor to track with. And so there was a direct correlation. Now, um, The thing about fat in animal products is that it's saturated fat. And it tends to thicken the blood and clog the arteries and interfere with all kinds of cellular processes. Now, animal, pro animal fat does that more than vegetable fat, but vegetable fat does that too. So you gotta watch out for that for reasons beyond cancer. And what I'm talking about now is diabetes, particularly type two diabetes. I said before briefly that the myth is that diabetes is a sugar-related disease and you should cut the carbs and sugar in your diet. Well, the sugar problem with diabetes is the symptom of the underlying cause, and the underlying cause is insulin resistance caused by fat interfering with the insulin process. With insulin not working, the, blood, the, the, the cells cannot receive the sugar that they're supposed to receive from the blood, from the blood so the sugar level in the blood stays high. Now I'm gonna play another video from Dr. Neil Barnard, who explains this fat and oil connection to diabetes. And as I said before, you can cure diabetes in 60 days with a diet that is low or zero fat. So here we go, this is Dr. Barnard. It was roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn. Except for special occasions when it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. And that's sort of the way we ate. But my father did not like the cattle business. So he left, left the family farm, and he went to medical school. And he spent his life at the Fargo Clinic treating diabetes. He became the diabetes expert for the whole region. And I have to say, my father really was, was frustrated because patients were given diets that they did not like. What we would say is, or what they would say is, diabetes is a condition where there's too much sugar in your blood. So don't eat anything that turns to sugar. So don't eat bread, don't eat fruit, don't eat pasta, don't eat rice, don't eat sweet potatoes, don't eat regular potatoes, don't eat beans, don't eat carrots. All these things had to be limited. And while you're at it, cut calories. And that's what people were supposed to adhere to. That gets old by Wednesday. Patients were also given medicines. And they were given needles and instruction on how to stick their fingers and how to inject insulin. And despite all of this, diabetes never got better. It always progressed. And it then became something that we were exporting overseas. And when I got out of medical school, we had more medicines. And I think we had sharper needles. But to tell you the truth, it was the same sort of result. We had unhappy patients and, and, and we, we never ever cured this disease. It never turned around. It was always considered a progressive disease. But there were two scientific discoveries that really turned all of this, this around. And the first one was taking the widest possible lens. If you look around the world at those countries that have the least diabetes, like Japan, for example, they weren't following anything like the diet that we were giving to diabetic patients. We, they weren't saying, gee, I'm not gonna eat rice, I won't eat noodles. They eat this, this kind of food all the time. It's front and center on their plate. And the second discovery came from looking inside the cell, especially the muscle cell. And the reason we look at muscle cells in particular is that's where glucose is going. That's where blood sugar is going. That's the fuel that powers your movement. You, you know about a person who's running a marathon? What are they doing in the weeks leading up for it? They're, they're carbo loading. So they're eating pasta and they're eating bread to try to get that glucose into the cell for energy. 
And that is the problem in diabetes. Because glucose, glucose is there outside the cell trying to get inside. In order to get in, it needs a key. And that key is insulin. Now, what if I get home? And I'm getting up to my front door and I take my key out of my pocket. I put it in the front door. Wait a minute. It's not working. And there's nothing wrong with my key. But I look in the lock and while I was gone, somebody put chewing gum in my lock. So what am I gonna do, crawl in and out the, the window? No, I'm gonna clean out the lock. Well, when a person has diabetes, their insulin key is not working. Why would that be? Why could insulin not signal this? What's supposed to happen is the glucose is supposed to enter into the cell. And glucose is the key that makes that happen. But the reason it doesn't happen, it's not that there's chewing gum inside the cell. What there is is fat. Fat, little globules of fat. Now, I have to say doctors hate words like fat. It's got one syllable. So we want to call it <laughs> intramyocellular lipid. Um, intra means inside. Myo means muscle. Cellular means cellular. Lip, lipid, lipid means fat. Intramyocellular lipid is fat inside your muscle cells. And that is what interferes with insulin's ability to work like a key to signal glucose coming in. Now, in 2003, the National Institutes of Health gave my research team a grant and said, let's test something completely different. Instead of limiting breads and all of these kinds of things, what if, if fat is the issue, what if we have a diet that has effectively no fat in it? Well, where does fat come from? It comes from two sources, animal products, animal fat and vegetable oils. So we brought in 99 people and we asked them to do two things to really eat a bounty of food and not worrying about quantity. We're not counting calories here. We are not counting carb grams or anything like that. What we're doing instead is we're setting the animal product aside, keeping the vegetable oils low. Very simple. Now, one of our participants was a man named Vance. And Vance's father was dead by age 30. Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes. He was in his late 30s when he came to see us. And he said, this is not hard. Unlike every other diet he'd been on, we didn't care how many carbs he ate or how many calories or how many portions. If he was having chili, not a meat chili, it would be a bean chili, chunky vegetable chili. If he was having spaghetti, instead of a meat topping, it would be topped with artichoke hearts and wild mushrooms and chunky tomato sauce and that kind of thing. Very, very easy. Over a course of about a year, he lost 60 pounds. His blood sugar came down and down and down. And one day his doctor sat him down and said, Vance, I know you've had family members die of this disease, but as I look at your blood tests, you don't have it anymore. And can you imagine what that feels like to have family members who felt this was absolutely a one-way street and to have this disease just turn around? And when I asked Vance's permission to tell you about... So there you go. Uh, diabetes is caused by fat and oil. And it's reversible just by reversing the habit. Now, the last video I'm going to show you is by a doctor, Caldwell Esselstyn. He's going to talk about cardiovascular disease. These are the three big ones, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, that are the most readily affected by diet. So um, Esselstyn, uh, again, cardiology. So let's take a look. How do you injure the artery in the first place? What seems to be going wrong? Now, on the right, there's a seriously diseased artery. And you're probably saying that's going to have a heart attack. No, that only causes about 10% of heart attacks, but it certainly will cause chest pain and shortness of breath. What I really want you to notice is on the left. And here, on the inside of this artery, there's this very, very tiny little dark single layer of cell magic carpet that all experts would agree is where the inception of this disease occurs. This magic carpet is called the endothelium. And the endothelium has an absolutely magic molecule that it produces. It's a gas, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide has a number of wonderful functions. Nitric oxide keeps our blood flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Two, 
Nitric oxide is the strongest vasodilator in the body. When you climb stairs, <clears throat> the arteries to your heart dilate. The arteries to your legs dilate. Nitric oxide inhibits inflammation from the wall of the artery, protects you from getting hypertension. And most importantly, nitric oxide in plentiful amounts will protect you from ever developing <clears throat> blockages or plaque. All right, how do those 90% of heart attacks occur. You will see here the artery is divided and what you're looking at in the first series on the left is that when you start eating that cheeseburger, the pizza, the milkshake, your blood flow gets sticky. And certain elements like your endothelial cells get sticky, your LDL cholesterol gets sticky and then the LDL bad cholesterol migrates into the subendothelial space where it sets up this absolute cauldron of inflammation and that cauldron of inflammation begins making inflammatory enzymes that gradually begin to thin out this delicate cap over the plaque gets thinner and thinner until it's as thin as a cobweb and then the sheer force of blood going over that thinned out plaque ruptures and now we have spillage of plaque content into the flowing blood which activates our platelets our clotting factor. And now we have the beginning of a clot, a thrombosis, which is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of minutes, now we have an artery that is totally blocked and all the downstream heart muscle has been deprived of oxygen and nutrients and starts to die. And that's the heart attack. But there is something absolutely magically exciting about this series because if I can convince you that all you have to do is train your, your, your nutrition so your internal biochemistry is such that you will not injure or thin out the cap over your plaque, you will actually diminish your plaque and you will strengthen the cap over the plaque. All right, how do we do this? It's very easy. We avoid the foods that injure the endothelium. What are they? Even pure virgin olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, dairy, anything with a mother or a face, meat fish. <laughs> <laughs> meat fish, chicken and turkey, and also caffeine and coffee and fructose. All right. What are you going to eat? <laughs> All those marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, and pasta. 101 different types of legumes. Vegetables, which are red, yellow, and green leafy, and fruit. But especially the green leafy vegetables are like water on the fire. What green leafy vegetables? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, green fruit beans, napa cabbage, <laughs> Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and I'm out of breath. <laughs> but remember, no oil. Now, conventional cardiology with all those procedures and all that expense is high mortality, high morbidity, and sadly, it does not cure the disease and the expense is unsustainable. However, when you're treating causality with plant-based nutrition, no mortality with the diet, no morbidity with the diet, and what happens with the passage of time, the benefits just continue to improve. And lastly, nobody has greater fear of another heart attack than somebody who's already had a heart attack and how empowering it can be for them and their family to know that they themselves can now become the locus of control for this disease, destroying it, whereas in the past it had been trying to destroy them. Okay, so cardiovascular disease is reversible. It's caused by diet and it's reversible by diet. Now he made a key point, it's not just the animal fat, but it's the vegetable oil too. And there are two classifications of vegetable oil. There's the natural cold press, extra virgin olive oil type things. And then there's the highly processed corn oil, safflower oil, and something like that. We used to say, oh, the 
the good oils, like the olive oil and the avocado oil and the coconut oil, the non-processed oil, that's the good oil. And then there's all that yucky stuff that's the processed oil. True, there is a difference in healthfulness between those two. But also true, any oil is going to create havoc. Any oil. And the thing about oil is, it's everywhere. When you look in the ingredient list on the, the products you buy, it's everywhere. And it's usually the processed stuff. So you got to watch out. Now, when I first made the change to my diet, I, of course, I did the, the animal-free part right away. But the vegetable oil thing, and I, and I avoided the bad vegetable oils. But the good vegetable oils, I wasn't quite aware yet of that issue. So I didn't cut that. Then I learned it, and then I cut it. Two things happened when I cut it. Number one, I lost another 10, 15 pounds beyond where I'd already come. The second thing is, my acne went away. 40 years I've been dealing with that. 40 years went away in a matter of days. Now, it's not 100% away. It's about 99% away. And apparently I have a sensitivity to the oil because I can tell <laughs> by how I react whether I've had something that has oil in it. And I used to eat a lot of nuts in my vegetarian diet. But I've cut those because they're high in oil. So it's not just the added oil, but it's high oil content foods. And there are a couple of big categories, nuts and seeds. I cut them out completely. Other people might consider just, you know, moderation on, the, on that. Avocados are high in fat. Again, I cut them completely. Maybe you'll cut them not so completely, depending on your personal sensitivity. I mean, avocados are huge, right? Huge. <laughs> and uh, coconut and olives, of course. So just be aware, oil is an issue. And this particular doctor, Esselstyn, he yells and screams, no oil, no oil, no oil, uh, because it's been proven to cause cardiovascular disease. So in general, animal proteins increase inflammation and acidification in your body, which causes a whole host of diseases. Inflammation is where the immune system is triggered by toxins or excess sugar too, to start attacking whatever, including your own cells. Chronic low-grade inflammation contributes to cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, and other conditions. Now people always ask, well, if you're going to cut the animal products, what about the iron? Don't you need iron from meat? I should have put that on my myth list. You probably are not iron deficient, and you probably don't need to worry about getting iron from animal products or from supplements. Now, there's a difference between iron that comes from animal meat. It's called heme iron. It's a much more absorbable type, and because of that, it can lead to iron excess, and that will cause oxidative stress which is when free radicals, which are the internal byproducts of external and external chemicals, they attack pathogens, but when there's too many of them, if there's an imbalance with free radicals and antioxidants, then they'll attack healthy cells. So you get this oxidative stress, too many free radicals. And iron, excess iron contributes to that. Um, so because animal products have a more absorbable type of iron, you're in danger of iron excess. Your body does not shed iron. It recycles it. The only way to shed iron is to bleed. And if you think you might be iron deficient, get tested. Don't guess. Just get tested. And you may be surprised to find out that you're not. Iron accumulates in the liver, in the heart, and the pancreas, and it can cause iron toxicity. And cancer loves iron. It feeds on it. It hoards iron and feeds on it. Plant-based iron sources are good enough and uh, without any risk of toxicity. So let me say something else about disease frequency, especially cancer. It's not about genetics. <laughs> Everybody wants to know your family history. What they're finding out from your family history is what your diet was taught by your family. Okay, we, we grew up in the same family. We learned the habits that our family taught us. That's why you have a family history. Now, genetics are what they are, but a lot of your genes are turned on or off by processes in the body, including diet. And a lot of these genes that cause havoc, they wouldn't cause havoc if they were just kept silent, if they weren't triggered and turned on by dietary factors. So it's really not about genetics. 
Plant nutrition controls which genes get turned on and how they function. Animal products trigger the activation of genes that you don't necessarily want to have activated. Now, speaking of diet research and the level of disease and longevity associated with it, here's another resource, a book called The Blue Zones, one of the most comprehensive studies on the subject of diet and longevity and disease by Dan Buettner, where they studied people from around the world, searching around who has the longest lifespans, who around the world has the least disease, all kinds of diseases. And identifying these populations of people around the world and then looking into their lifestyle and seeing if there's any factors that might explain this. So they found people in 10 different zones around the earth, they call them blue zones, all these different places around the earth. And they had one thing in common, low animal product consumption, high vegetable product consumption. That was the one common factor between all these populations that lived longer and had less disease. And they kind of lived off the grid, more or less, you know, without all the chemicals and so forth as well. So they kind of determined that if your diet consists of maybe 5 to 10% max animal products, you will be in a blue zone. Live longer and have less disease. And they didn't analyze why, they just analyzed the results. And uh, whether you understand why or not, the results are what they are. So the competitor to the vegetarian or the plant-based diet is the low carb concept. Oh yeah, we need more protein, less carbs, the carbs are bad. And people say, well, I lost a lot of weight on my low carb diet. Well, that's because if you cut out sugar and refined flour, which are basically the same thing, you're going to reduce your overall calories, you're going to lose weight. But it's a high fat and high protein diet, which is unhealthy. So you can lose the weight on either diet, believe it or not. You can lose weight on a high carb diet. I ate a very high carb diet and I lost 50 plus pounds by cutting fat. It's all about the fat. I'm going to take another session. We're going to talk about the carbs and fat and the weight loss thing. But carbs are good if they are whole foods because they're nutrient rich. They have the fiber, which feeds the gut microbiome. And by the way, the body would rather burn carbs than convert them to fat. If you don't give the body fat to store, it's not going to hunt for carbs to make fat. It'd rather just take the fat, convert it to human fat, and pack it on. So if your diet is low fat or zero fat, you will lose weight even on a high carb diet. It's not about the carbs. Okay, so what we just talked about is the nature of animal products and how they affect your health. Now let me talk about the animal products themselves, apart from you, and how what we've been given as ter in terms of the food supply has problems that didn't exist maybe 150, 200 years ago, but they exist in the modern society. On a lot of farms that raise animal agriculture, they're feeding animals the wrong natural food. For example, cows. What is a cow's natural food? Grass. What do they feed them on the farm? Soybeans, corn, blah, blah, blah. They live on it, but it's not their natural food. Why do they feed them that? Well, it's easier, cheaper, faster to get it to, get it to them. It's the wrong thing. Now, what does that do to them? I don't know, but it's not healthy. And that unhealthiness, if you consume the meat, which you might or might not do anyway, but if you do, now you've got whatever problems they had, now you're gonna inherit something, who knows what? Again, I don't know what, maybe even science doesn't know what, but it matters. Okay, what else do they do on the farms? They feed those animals antibiotics, a lot of them. Did you know that of all the antibiotic use in America, most of it goes to farms? not to people. Now, it's not just because animals have diseases, but it's because animals get fatter on antibiotics. Plain and simple, they just get fatter. That's why they feed it to them. Now, those antibiotics, they get in, you, in the meat and they are in your meal. They're in your steak, they're in your pepperoni, they're in your sausage, they're in your bacon, they're in everything that's got animal products, it's in there. And of course, that will, un that will mess up your gut microbiome, 
It's a huge problem. We've got an unbalanced mi gut microbiome, spawning antibi antibiotic resistant superbugs. Antibiotic thing is huge. What else do they do to the animals? They add hormones to their diet. They inject them whatever they do to, to make them fatter, faster, to grow up faster. Do those hormones come into your body? Where else are they gonna go? They're in the animal products. They're coming into your body too. Do you want extra hormones of who knows what? Can't do you any good. Speaking of hormones, on dairy farms, in order to keep those cows producing milk, they keep them pregnant all the time. Now, believe it or not, cows will lactate while they're pregnant, which is not the case for other animals and humans. But the but cows, they will. The more they the more they're pregnant, the more they will produce milk. So they keep them pregnant all the time, just raising more calves, and then uh, getting more milk from the cows. Well. The cow's natural hormone balance is going to have a lot of estrogen while they are pregnant. A lot of other pregnancy-related hormones, and that's in the milk. That's on your shelves when you drink the milk and the dairy products. Estrogen in milk is a huge issue. And um, it wouldn't happen with a cow that's lactating but not pregnant. But when you've got a cow that's both lactating and pregnant, there's a lot more estrogen. And, and so we're seeing the effect on people's development. Puberty is happening earlier in girls, and it's getting ridiculous out there. Okay, what else do they do? Well, there's, there's pesticides and herbicides on the plants that they, gra that they raise to make animal feed. It's getting into the food. It's getting into the animal. It's getting into you when you eat the animal. What about... GMOs, genetically modified organisms. They grow GMO crops to have natural insecticides in the plants. That stuff is fed to people and to animals. And nobody really knows whether that's doing any harm or not. Some people say, oh, it's perfectly safe. Others say, oh, no, it's bad. I haven't seen any definitive information one way or the other. But how can it be, how can it be good if you're... If you're genetically modifying a plant to produce a pesticide in its own substance, how can that be good? It's in the animal food, it's in the animal meat. And then there's the old problem of the filth and the conditions and the diseases in the farms and the viruses. You know, there's some cancers that are known to be caused by viruses, including bovine source leukemia virus. You ever heard of mad cow disease? That's a virus in cows. You know, where, you know how it propagates in a farm? When they, when they slaughterhouse process the, processes the cows, there's a lot of leftovers. Some of it goes into dog food, some of it goes into your hot dogs, some of it goes back into the cattle feed. Recycle the animal products in the animal feed. If there's viruses, mad cow disease is a brain virus. If it's in that residue, now they're feeding the cows the virus that now spreads. So that's how it spreads. What about seafood? Well, unfortunately, the ocean is polluted. <laughs> it's worse than we thought. The critics are right. I'm not a huge ideologue, but the facts are what they are. Everything in the world drains to the ocean, right? And there is a lot of pollution out there, stuff that doesn't go away. And the bigger the fish, the more they're taking that up. Because the little fish have a little bit of pollution in them. The big fish eat the little fish. It concentrates the pollution in the bigger fish. And those are the bigger fish, the tuna, the salmon, the shark, those, the swordfish, those are our favorites, right? The bigger the fish, they have a higher concentration of toxins. So those are the dangers that exist in animal agriculture. They just are what they are. And uh, so from a, from a sort of a philosophical sense, it is true that animal agriculture has cruelty, unsanitary conditions, environmental pollutants, unnaturally and nutritionally toxic. And you, have, you can have your own level of care about those kind of things. Sometimes people are very ideological about those things. Personally, my interest is practicality and health. I can avoid those things on that basis. But yet the ideologues are correct in their criticisms. So as a practical matter, commercial farming is uh, a lot of times unhealthy. Now, then there's the chemicals in the processing of foods between the farm and the shelf. On top of those ordinary hazards, 
And there are certain highly processed meats like sausage, bacon, hot dogs, pepperoni, salami, deli meats, jerky. These have a ton of chemicals. In fact, the WHO, World Health Organization, classifies those things as class one carcinogens, particularly because of colon cancer. There's a strong correlation with colon cancer. So, if you're gonna buy meat, if you're gonna eat meat, it does matter to stick with organic varieties. Um, and in general though, of all the factors we're gonna be talking about, this one is the big one, the animal products. Eliminating animal products is the most significant part of a dietary change for health because it's the most pervasive element in our, in our popular diet. And it's the most potent culprit for so many diseases. So if you, if you cut or eliminate or, or reduce animal products, you kill three birds with one stone, the protein, the fat, and the chemicals. And ultimately, you'll adapt if you care to do that. And you'll feel better and you'll be better. So um, everything that I've talked about in terms of these experts, those videos are on my website, icuredcancer.com. And um, next time we're gonna get even more specific about more specific things, all right? Okay, thanks.